Toby Hayward, thanks for being with us. No problem, it's good to be here. Group M is an incredibly diverse organisation. Can you give us an overview of the business? Firstly, it's the parent company of the four main media buying agencies, uh, uh, Mindshare, MEC, Maxis and, and Mediacom. And I think before anything else, it's important to say that um, it is extremely important to WPP, to Group M, that all those agencies retain uh, very much their sort of individuality and their peculiarities and their idiosyncrasies, um, uh, which have been built up over the years and with the clients that they have. Having said that, there are many areas in which Group M uh, can actually improve, if you like, uh, the, uh, the trading position. Um, uh, of, those, of those particular agencies. I think you could look at it in two ways, probably internal and external. The internal is the more obvious way. Um, rather than having four finance departments, four HR departments, four IT departments um, and all that, of course we just have the one. So we're initially seeing some internal uh, benefits uh, on that side of things simply just by collapsing all those areas into one. Um, it probably gets more interesting when you look at the external side of it. Uh, I mean, some of that efficiency you can carry over in your conversations with research companies. Uh, why have four different agencies talking about the same level of research buying when you can actually just make it one conversation on behalf of Group M and also get particular uh, you know, cost efficiencies in doing that. More than that, though, I think it's the, uh, I mean, we call it the intelligent application of scale. Um, but that comes into areas such as, increasingly, um, areas such as um, trading, um, various innovation, uh, digital as well. Um, the trading side of it, again, sometimes it makes more sense for us to go to a media publisher and do uh, an arrangement with them, perhaps an umbrella arrangement that benefits all of the, or an umbrella arrangement that covers all of the four agencies and allows them to then trade within that or allows them to then negotiate, but under, if you like, an overarching cover. Um, so that's been particularly effective in a number of markets. Um, I think also as we move into the, uh, into the, into the more into the digital area, uh, a particularly good example was the launch uh, at the end of June this year of Xaxis, um, which is um, uh, you know, very much the uh, Group M's or WPP's response uh, to setting up a, a major um, digital buying company. Uh, that's launched in a number of markets now, not in Asia with the exception of Australia yet, but ultimately it will roll out into other markets as well. So I think the, the combination of all that is, is that if you look at it internally and externally, uh, Group M, without touching any of the sovereignty of the agencies, uh, manages to give substantial benefits to those agencies, um, both, uh, both in terms of what we do internally in the office and actually how we trade externally as well. What's the history of branded content with Group M? Everyone's probably got their own definitions of branded content. I mean, fundamentally, I suppose, um, and branded content covers a number of areas as well, such as uh, product placement, I guess. Um, but fundamentally, it's a program. Um, it doesn't have to be television. It could be an event, but something that is created specifically by a client to, uh, to make an event or a program um, that obviously addresses a particular marketing requirement of that client. Um, now, clearly there has to be an element of subtlety employed there. Um, there's no point in making something that's just effectively a, a 30 minute long or a one hour long commercial for, for an advertiser. Um, so I think the, uh, you know, that, can, that can range from a number of different areas. Um, I think that uh, you know, some types of branded content could be on major oil company Shell, for example, um, funding entirely a program about future energy needs and future energy developments. Now, that does not have to feature Shell in every single aspect of the programming, but clearly in dealing with that topic, it's inevitably going to touch on areas that Shell are involved in. But you get the benefits of both. Shell get to show that they are looking into future energy um, issues, and at the same time, it becomes an, a program of specific interest as well. Um, but I think it can, it can involve events. Um, it can involve you know, a, a soft drink manufacturer um, sponsoring fun runs and providing the, you know, the sort of energy drinks to that fun run as well. So it, it's really a question of, in a, I suppose, in a believable fashion, bringing together an advertiser's requirements um, in a way that is, uh, that is interesting and engaging to the viewer or the participant. You mentioned subtlety. Can you be too subtle? Yes, I think you can be. I mean, if you are too subtle or too clever, then the entire advertising message is going to drift by. 
um, or the client's involvement is going to drift by without any real sort of knowledge or, 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 or client involvement being imparted. Um, and branded content as well. I mean, it's, uh, um, it, it can be, I, I think sometimes it, pl w w it plays particularly well um, with, with online video um, where, you know, the, the ad itself becomes the branded content. I mean, it be, you know, using humour um, is always a very good way of getting over an advertising message. Uh, so I don't think advertisers should be ashamed or, or nervous about actually trying to position their brand within branded content. But um, I don't think there's any magic solution to it. But to your point, yes, making it too subtle. Um, I mean, maybe it lodges deep in the brain somewhere. But at some point, you know, there, there, there has to be a payback from it. There's, there has to be a purpose to doing it. There's obviously a line between editorial, factual and branded content. Where do you draw that line? The line is usually drawn by the publisher themselves um, or the media owner, the television company, uh, the newspaper, to what extent they will divide up their page into advertising and editorial. Um, so I think that that's probably just a constant sort of dynamic tension between, between advertiser and, uh, and publisher there. Um, I think that organisations that take themselves correctly, very seriously, like perhaps news channels or whatever, will, will guard that more carefully. And organisations that are just there to provide general entertainment can be a lot more flexible. Group M forecasts that the advertising spend in measured media would exceed $500 billion. In the current climate, does that still hold true? It is still over $500 billion. It has been revised down, I think, by about 1% or $5 billion. Um, now I think we're reasonably confident on that going forward. I think there are potential storm clouds on the horizon. Uh, we're not even on the horizon with us right now. I mean, it's been an extraordinary year, what with the disasters in Japan, the spring uh, uprisings in the Middle East, uh, the American debt problem, uh, the European debt problem. Uh, you know, it seems to go on and on and on. Um, and recently we've obviously seen quite significant falls in stock markets as well. But fundamental company health seems to be reasonably good. Uh, WPP's results, I think the half yearly results published a few weeks ago, uh, were pretty healthy. And uh, you know, so I think the, there are storm clouds there. Um, to what extent they affect Asia Pacific is another, is, is another e issue. Um, much is always said about how Asia Pac or China or whatever is, is decoupling itself from the West. Um, I think that's a little um, uh, overstates the case. But as we go through each economic crisis or downturn that ultimately comes out of the West, um, it's clear that there is sort of like a further distancing um, between the West and this region's ability to, to soldier on regardless. What are your thoughts on online video as a tool for marketers? Our online video clearly is, uh, is an area that's growing enormously. Um, you know, we're way past the rather scuzzy, fuzzy um, uh, or videos of a few years ago. Um, quality now is, uh, is extremely good. I think you can, you can you clearly define it, or the marketers, people define it in, in various different ways. And I'm not a total expert in the field, but you clearly have the five minute short clip stuff under five minutes. And then you have the longer form programming. The longer form programming seems to be driven more at the moment by catch up viewing. Um, although not available in Asia, things like Hulu in the States, very much sort of, you know, a combination of various media companies and providing, you know, uh, the viewing. If you happen to miss it last night, you could see it again. Um, shorter length uh, video um, is, the, is the one perhaps of, uh, of more interest because it's a little bit more difficult to uh, find the right way to insert advertising into it. Um, perhaps if you're watching Hulu, you don't mind sitting through 30 seconds of pre-roll before the programming. Um, but even that's under question as well now. People are still get irritated if they have advertising put on them. Uh, there was some research, and I'm not sure uh, precisely the source of it, but that moves more towards accepting the fact that if you want to have quality online video, then it's fair to get some advertising. And people maybe buy into that. Um, but perhaps the issue there is to let them choose the advertising, is to let them have a selection of ads that they will watch before the programming itself. And the other thing is also to have intelligent selection of pre-roll as well for, for, the, for online video. If you're watching football clips, then it's probably a good idea to get a Nike or an Adidas spot full of uh, you know, superstar football players as one of the ads that is going to pre-roll into that video. Toby, thanks very much for being with us. Not at all. Thank you very much indeed.